Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the main committee room of uh, Canberra's Parliament House um, for today's Senate occasional lecture. Uh, we meet here today in Canberra's centenary year, where, of course, people have met for thousands of years. So I want to acknowledge the Namadji and Ngambri people, who are the traditional custodians of this land, and pay respect to their elders past and present. Uh, 2013 marks several important anniversaries. Uh, 70 years ago, for instance, uh, the first women were elected to the federal parliament, with Dorothy Tangney elected as a senator for Western Australia and Enid Lyons elected as a member of the House of Representatives. This year is also the 110th anniversary of women winning the right to vote and the right to stand for election in Australia. So we thought we would mark this occasion with today's Senate occasional lecture on the evolution of the representation of women in the federal parliament. Um, I'm uh, Richard Pine, the Deputy Clerk of the Senate, and I'm uh, deputising today for Dr Rosemary Lang, the Clerk of the Senate, who commissioned uh, today's lecture. Um, it's of enormous regret to her that she can't be here today for uh, matters outside of her control, um, but she did want me in particular to uh, welcome our speakers today, uh, Dr Rosemary Crowley, Amanda Vanstone, both of whom are former senators and former cabinet ministers, and uh, Laura Tingle, who is the political editor from the uh, Australian Financial Review and a very accomplished and influential political correspondent. <laughs> uh, she asked me to say that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Our first speaker today is uh, the Honourable Dr Rosemary Crowley, who was an ALP Senator for South Australia from 1983 to 2002. During her time in the Senate, Senator Crowley drew on her experience as a medical practitioner to become involved in significant reforms to Medicare legislation and spoke strongly in support of the Sex Discrimination Bill 1983 and its subsequent amendments. Senator Crowley also served on numerous Senate committees and was Minister for Family Services from 1993 to 96 and Minister assisting the Prime Minister for the Status of Women. I'd like to join me in welcoming uh, the Honourable Dr Rosemary Crowley. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to acknowledge, first of all, that we are meeting on the land of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people, and I respect their spiritual and ongoing relationship with this land. I'd also say that if you're asked to speak about women in parliament, you foolishly say, yep, that'll, that'll be okay. And then you start thinking about it. So before I forget, I want to acknowledge the many, many women in Parliament, including Rosemary Lang, and please give her my regrets, she's got a great name. Um, <laughs> but I acknowledge the number of women in Parliament who are not parliamentarians, who along with many men have worked to make uh, the lives of parliamentarians like me uh, very easy, fantastic, and I particularly acknowledge their support. In fact, um, I discovered the Senate well, I've actually been in my life a doctor, a minister, and a something else, a senator, all wonderfully non-sexist terms. But I have to say, in the parliament, I found the Senate staff fell over backwards to make life easy for me and my colleagues. So I'd like them to be known as, um, uh, if not the men, certainly the women in parliament, but men too, Richard. In the last 200 years or so, women have campaigned to uh, get the vote on the grounds that it would be a good idea to have a voice in their own um, laws and so on. By late last century, I think in the Western world, Switzerland had a canton that was still resisting the women's vote until the late 1900s, but I'm sure there's somebody here who can tell me that's not quite right. So um, for all errors in this speech, I apologize now and will be happily corrected later. Um, uh, curiously, when it comes to the vote, Australia, the British colony, beat the motherland by many decades. But the right to vote did not improve the, the lot for the majority of women. They were still second-class citizens. By the way, can everybody hear me? Okay. Is that better? Okay, thank you. Um, women were still second-class citizens. Uh, as our parliaments were places for making rules that govern our society and so on, women thought we need to get there too. So I'd like to acknowledge today the arrival in this place 70 years ago of Dame Enid Lyons and Dorothy Tangney and the women who followed them. But 
something else was needed. And I think you could say, so, I'd like to say so, so emerged the women's movement of the late 60s and 70s. It was not the first campaign by women, but it was timely. If the 70s were a decade of great change and or desire for change in our society, particularly seen in the women's movement, the women's electoral lobby, the development of women's shelters to provide safe haven from women leaving domestic violence and much more. Another thing that helped was the dramatic publication of the women's electoral lobby on the attitudes to women by men in parliament before the 1972 election. Some of you may be old enough to remember. <laughs> it certainly started a heady debate about what women uh, thought of themselves and what men thought of women. Not too much radicalism back then. Uh, it did start off the debate about women and the place of women in our society. In Australia, it corresponded with the election of the Whitlam government. Gough Whitlam addressed gatherings with the sentence, men and women of Australia. Now that was the first time any politician I felt really spoke to me. He did other things besides, he won the election. He appointed the first women's advisor, I think in the world, but certainly in Australia. I, th I think it is the first woman advisor in the world, but I'm happier to be corrected on that too. Um, and he, he um, uh, assisted or over, was there at the time when many more women were taking different roles, particularly in the public service and in the community. Uh, free tertiary education meant more women were going off to university, etc. Then Whitlam was sacked, but the women's movement did not die. In the 70s, there was a small increase in the number of women entering the parliament and a further significant increase in the 1983 election. Uh, of the Hawke government. There were now six women in the House of Representatives, all Labour. Joan Child, Ros Kelly, Elaine Darling were elected in 1980, and they were joined in 1983 by Wendy Fate and Jeanette McHugh and Helen Mayer. They were joined with senators from all parties, the majority also Labour. Senators Margaret Guilfoyle, Margaret Reid, Shirley Walters, Florence Bielke peterson Cathy Sullivan were Liberal National, that is to say some were liberal, one was national, I think. Jeanette Haynes, Democrat. Susan Ryan, Jean Hearn, Pat Giles, Ruth Coleman. Be sensible and take that off. Uh, we're joined by new chums, Olive Zakharoff, Margaret Reynolds uh, and Rosemary Crowley. 13 senators, seven of them Labor. As you've just heard, I was one of those senators elected in 93. And when I was elected, I was the first woman the Labour Party in South Australia ever sent to Canberra, a mere 89 years after we won not only the right to vote, but the right to stand for Parliament. I believe I'm the first federal woman minister from South Australia, but I do not match the achievements of Amanda Vanstone, who served 10 years in Cabinet and is the longest serving cabinet, woman Cabinet Minister, I think. Is that correct, Amanda? Excellent. The Labor government was elected with a platform that included a document towards equality. It spelled out 42 proposals to advance the position of women in Australia, to give them a choice, a say and a fair go. It included sex discrimination legislation, affirmative action, child care, women's health programs, equal employment programs, anti-discrimination violence campaigns, education programs for girls, for girls, women and oh, sorry, for girls, women and sports, superannuation, Medicare, and more. It also had descriptions of mechanisms to uh, see these things happen, like the Office of the Status of Women and Women's Desks in Departments. It was Labor Senator Susan Ryan who had carriage of the, the Sex Discrimination Act, and given time constraints, I'll resist um, too much talk about that, but if you really want to read some nonsense, read the Hansards of the debate of the sex discrimination legislation. Uh, they were all the way from um, appalling, uh, untrue, um, disgraceful. Um, uh, women were not going to uh, stay at home, men were not going to open the doors for women, uh, and much more, but we, we, I'll try and skip through that. It, the, people thought the legislation was all about benefits for women. Yeah. That sent the misogynist hairs running. And in fact, the bill was about removing differences between men and women in the delivery services and so many other things. But as women were mostly discriminated in most of those areas, it certainly was of major benefit to women. Susan Ryan copped an awful attack 
both in the parliament and in the newspapers, both personal as well as political. However, the bill passed, and once it was passed, with some opposition senators crossing the floor to vote with the Labor government. But once it uh, uh, was passed, I have to tell you, the world did not stop spinning. Australia was not overrun by communists. Women did go on having babies and caring for them, cooking, getting married, and much more. But once the bill was passed, the media stories changed. The mad attacks stopped. As much I'd love to tell you about that, so if you want, you can ask me later. Um, I particularly want to, to tell you, though, that the, the legislation required a reporting at the end of the year of who'd benefited or brought complaints under the Sex Discrimination Act. There were um, what you would call lower paid women who were uh, unfairly dismissed or claimed to be, and men, men, yes, men in the Defence Forces. If you were married, you got a four bedroom house. If you were single, you got a barracks bunk across the ground to the ablutions block and the mess hall. Sex discrimination, the discrimination on marital status in the defence forces. <laughs> I have to tell you, the army wasn't perhaps sure that that was going to happen, but ever since then, they've been redesigning accommodation for defence forces. And it was a great help in arguing to point out, hey guys, this is legislation is of benefit to you if you've been discriminated against. We passed the Affirmative Action Agency legislation, and in 1984, Bob Hawke recommended that all government departments pr prepare an assessment on the impact of women in ongoing and new programs, and also we established a women's budget paper. I thought when we got into government, with increased numbers of women, it would be all systems go for changes for women. I have to say I was somewhat taken aback when I discovered that the opposition, many of whom were women, were not supportive of sex discrimination legislation and affirmative action. And they also opposed Medicare, one of the greatest reforms for and on behalf of women ever. I am going fast here, I'm sorry. All of this happened, of course, because we had a Labor government and we had the numbers. Um, we also had the women's budget paper, which looked at every department in terms of the funding spent on women versus the funding spent on men. And I could tell you serious examples, a slightly less serious but very pertinent example, and that's because of my interest in sport. I was able to ask the Minister for Sport, one Graham Richardson, was he aware that in his department there were half the number of men playing hockey as women, but women got half the money that men did. Small example, I have to say the minister changed that. And he did that, in fact, because we had the relevant data. What the gov Labor government and Labor women did was to change things. We put new items into the parliament and onto the agenda. I remember Senator Pat Giles telling me that she'd put uteruses onto the Senator, uh, Senate agenda. <laughs> I'm gonna refrain from telling you what I put on. If I said women's things, you'd get it. And if it started with tea, you'd get it even better. Um, as I said, no tax, but came with strings attached. Um, I'm not sure, thank you, whether it was Pat Giles or me, but one of us asked Mr. President if he'd noticed that Hansard, which claimed to be a record that was everything said in Parliament, was actually editing our speeches into the third person masculine. He and she became he, men and women became men. There was a... Um, sucking in of breath along the corridors of power, but we have it changed. And now Hansard does record what is said in Parliament, more or less. <laughs> it's not, 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 not editing us to the third person masculine anymore. Um, Susan Ryan and I started um, exercises in Parliament to help us get through long days. And so she knew about um, my interest in sport and asked me if I'd uh, do an inquiry into women in sport. And I just want to say a little bit about this, not, not for much, but I wanted to say that I did do that and I, I recommended the establishment, or our committee did, it was wonderful. We went around the country, talked to lots of people, men who you knew by intuition that people preferred to watch football. I was able to say, isn't intuition a women's category? And we nearly came to blows. <laughs> um, but you can see yourself. I turned 12 pages from the back of the paper Unlike many good women, I always start at the back of the paper. 12 pages in before I came to anything about women's sport in yesterday's newspaper. And that was a, a win victory by Australian Women's Netball. There, 
In sport, it is interesting. The changes for women in the general community are pretty marvellous. The changes for women's sport, it's almost as though nothing has happened since 1984. It's not fair and they don't get sufficient, but one can say about women's sport that unlike men's sport, it's not riven with scandalous and outrageous payments or betting scandals. So I'm not sure if that means we should stay the way we are or not, but I don't want to. Um, in the brief time left, Susan Ryan established also women's studies programs in philosophy departments of universities. And women were able to, if they passed that year, go straight into university. For many of them, this was just like the best gift ever. They did go straight into university. They did get degrees. They did go straight into the workforce. And almost all of them were at an age when they did not need childcare or any other support. That women's studies program dramatically increased our economy. And I'm not sure if there's ever been a study on how much, how many people and or how many women and what the economic benefit was. But I like to know things like that and argue them because quite often people say, well, all those women's things, don't you know the big issue is the economy? Yes, and how much women contribute to it. Could we please measure it on a breakdown? We did change the agenda and where it changes for women and society. But I think what the sex discrimination legislation did is actually um, help change our society. Lots of legislation passes, but it doesn't have an impact that runs deep into the whole society. We, the people of Australia, now had a different way of understanding the country we lived in, of how we talked about it. There was a new conversation, a new language, a new culture in Australia. It may have taken time, but change it did. If you find it hard to accept that claim, then look at our society now and consider the changes for our sons and daughters, if not for our grandchildren. We now have many more men and women in non-traditional areas. The changes have expanded our economy as well as our conversation and culture. No, perhaps the changes did not happen overnight, but change they did. The important point is that the evidence is now that the laws and the participation in our society make a huge difference for all those people involved. And that is why there are still people missing from our main story and we need to make sure that they also achieve representation, whether they're Aboriginal, Asian, migrants, newcomers, refugees or asylum seekers, men as well as women. I thought it'd be a good thing to get more women into Parliament, um, and we are very happy to do that as the Labor Party does with now a requirement of 40% reservation. I want to very quickly say that I was always shocked that the Liberal women uh, don't actually accept that. I think some do, quietly. But um, uh, I find it very irksome to sometimes talk with good Liberal women, uh, Amanda accepted, of course, um, who say that if you have to pick a woman because she's a woman, then it's a tokenism, and you'll just get a token. Well, I have to say the Labor Party is able to do things at once. Pick a woman and pick a very talented one. Two things, we can do it. And the interesting thing is if you have a look at the women in recent parliaments, you'd know that we've picked very, very capable and uh, able candidates. And I think these arguments sit strangely in a party which has a requirement that 50% of all Liberal committees have to be women. Uh, which was what was established when Mr Menzies was looking to start the Liberal Party and went to the good um, matrons of Turak. And they said, yes, we'll give you the money, provided 50% of all Liberal committees are, are women. Why is it that if you pick a man, it's never tokenism? <laughs> I just want to... Um, Finish, finish. <laughs> um, I, I can't tell you all the lovely stories about what happens when you go overseas and to talk with women, or for that matter, um, how important I thought it was to talk with women in any part of Australia, particularly South Australia, and how supportive they were. So if you ask questions about what I'm not in my paper, I'll tell you. Um, I'm not able to read to you. Uh, I want to just... Um, acknowledge that after the increase of, the, in fact, in, since the 1983 election, there has been a continuing increase of women in parliament. And I believe the Labour women in parliament are now 41%. That may indeed be across all parliaments. I'm not reliable on those da that data. Uh, but I want to say that if we want um, more women in parliament, and I believe we should as fair representation, uh, we need to make sure that that is um, 
I mean, we could consider 50% um, of the parliament were all Liberal women and 50% of that same parliament were all Labor men. And you, you know immediately it's not going to happen like that. So we need 50-50 of each of our major parties or with some of the independents too. I support the number of Liberal women in parliament and congratulate them and find them that I must be um, campaigning against them because of their Liberal policies. And likewise, I presume for me. But I think that after all the negativity, one can't pass the fantastic RU486 leg legislation when four women in the Senate from different parties united to submit a, a piece of legislation that succeeded. <laughs> and one wonders why it succeeded. And I would have thought that it's called, <laughs> not a good idea to beat this one, gentlemen. Let it through. And it did go through. Um, I've mentioned the cultural changes and I would like to stress that again, but I can't finish without a brief word about the treatment of our previous recent Prime Minister. And I want to uh, just say politicians in this country are fair game. No one objects to that, no matter how tough the cartoons get. But the appalling, sexist, abusive and foul cartoons against Julia Gillard were way, way beyond what is reasonable. I did not look up the cartoons from 1943, but I'll bet those first two ladies that came into this parliament were never cartooned like Julia Gillard. I had the great good fortune to be in parliament in a government committed to improving things for women with a number of women in its ranks. Women in parliament made a difference. The first steps were taken all those 70 years ago by two gracious women. And I'd like to suggest that um, uh, the example of good women in Parliament provided Amanda Van, by Amanda Vanstone and I has been, I think, set back a little by the uh, a strange and weird feminine, se sexist attacks on our previous Prime Minister. Thank you. There, there will be uh, time for questions at the end of the, uh, the um, lecture uh, for all speakers. Our second speaker is the Honourable Amanda Vanstone, uh, who was a Liberal Party Senator for South Australia from 1985 to 2007. Amanda, as I've promised to try to call her, can't stop calling people Senator, uh, became a member of the Shadow Ministry after only two years in the Senate and when the Coalition formed government in 1996 was appointed to Cabinet as Minister for Employment, Education, Training and Youth Affairs, subsequently holding several other ministerial portfolios including Justice and Customs, Family Community Services and Immigration and Multicultural and Indigenous Affairs. Senator Vanstone also served as Minister assisting the Prime Minister for the Status of Women and remains, as Rosemary Crowley pointed out, the longest serving female cabinet minister since Federation. Amanda Vanstone. Thanks very much. In, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we're on. The, um, the point of being here today is to recognise the anniversary of women coming into parliament and if you look at the records, as I did, uh, you might be shocked, as I was, to, to see how few they've been. And I was particularly shocked to realise that uh, up until the recent election, I'd met and known reasonably well most of all of these women, which is a disgrace. I mean, I was born in 52. What the hell is a person born in 52 uh, doing, being able to say that they met and know well most of the women who'd been in Parliament and in ministries? Anyway, look, you can look up the records for yourselves and see the numbers. What I'll try and do is give you some of the flavour and feeling of being there in the late 80s and uh, 90s and into the early 2000s. In 15 minutes, it's impossible to do a considered treatise. The best I can do is, if you imagine my mind as a supermarket, we're going to grab a trolley, run down the aisles and grab a few products. There's not necessarily anything terribly coherent about it. It's just a snapshot of what's there. I was really lucky to have my first years in Parliament with both Dame Margaret Guilfoyle and Susan Ryan. Uh, Dame Margaret was the first female in Cabinet with portfolio. And there's a lot of focus often on the first this and the first that. And, you know, there's a reason for that. But I think it's a mistake in one sense because often it means second, third and fourth don't get much of a look in when they've still uh, made pioneering contributions. And in Susan Ryan's case in particular, uh, she was the first woman in, in a Labor cabinet. So she had exactly the same experience 
well, not exactly the same, but in that context, the same experience, being the first to be the only one sitting around that table uh, of a different um, agenda. Uh, Margaret really was an iron fist in a velvet glove. Uh, if you look at Senator Button's remarks on her valedictory when she was leaving, he said he'd look across the chamber and amongst an ocean of swine, a sea arose. Uh, <laughs> so that was some sort of testimony to her uh, capacity. She also kept perspective. I remember walking across from the old Parliament House to the lobby restaurant for lunch with some New South Wales members and donors who wanted to meet the women. This is the goldfish bowl. Let's meet the women. And uh, we're running a bit late. I was a bit up. Uh, tense about uh, being late and uh, her, with her perspective she gently but firmly made the situation crystal clear. We're senators, we've been doing our job because our party meeting ran over time. We're employed by the people of Australia and grateful as we are to donors and simpatico as we are with Liberal members. We do not work for them, they are not our bosses. Now you might not think that's very important but if you look at the strength of political party machines, it is actually a very, very important thing to remember. On another occasion, there was a party room debate on whether we'd censure some minister or another over the treatment of a public servant. And sensing a bit of a biff might be coming on, the boys got a bit excited and everyone was up there speaking about how we should beat the daylights out of Labor for this. She uh, let the debate go on, spoke near the end, politely admitted, this is a classic use of language that, not exactly these words, obviously I didn't have a tape, but that she was simply unaware of how many speakers had direct knowledge of this matter. That's how you say, it's pretty obvious none of you have got it. <laughs> you know, I'm simply unaware, meaning I've listened to you carefully, haven't heard a damn thing. Uh, she recalled her knowledge of the particular person and his record under the previous Liberal government of dealing with a minister, and her attitude wasn't a good one. I can't recall now whether she said she'd be absent, or I doubt that, or whether she'd say she'd make her views plain if asked. I just don't recall. Maybe nothing was said on that. But her contribution made, she said if there was a censure motion, she wouldn't be supporting it. Full stop. So all the people who are in for a biff had to have a rethink. Because now there was a contribution that had been made that was calm, strong, informed, and pointed, very pointed. And as I recall, the motion wasn't put. It was a very impressive uh, contribution. Now in the old Parliament House, Rose and I started, and the architecture, all the layout and facilities ensured ministers intermingled more with uh, backbenches of both sides. There wasn't a ministerial wing. Your room had a hand basin, a bench, a few cups and saucers and a kettle. Uh, that meant in the corridors there was an ebb and flow of people going to and from the cafeteria, the dining room and the bathrooms. And that's how a relatively new uh, young backbencher for the opposition ended up talking to Susan Ryan, washing her hands in the bathroom. And she was very famous at the time, and I was just a new young opposition person. And I remember, still remember her saying, you know, you'll be grateful you've had some time in opposition. I thought, yeah, just <laughs> good on you saying that from government. <laughs> but of course, I now know what she said was entirely true. Uh, and I also recall one night when uh, uh, I went with a staffer to congratulate her on the passage of a bill for which I had not voted, and happily had not voted, just to make it clear to Rosemary. Um, the fact I didn't like the bill didn't mean that this wasn't an achievement uh, for her. And uh, Senator Crowley might remember this night that then Finance Minister uh, Peter Walsh was in her office, as were you, uh, Rosemary. And there was a justifiable celebratory mood, as one has when one's had an achievement. And Ryan's response to my arrival was not laced with the sourness that comes from those narrow worldviews some people hold and from petty politicians. Quite the opposite. And there are a few petty ones around at the time, probably still are. They're quite the opposite. She happily announced that perhaps tonight was a good night to break out that one bottle of ideologically unsound champagne, she called it. How could I say no? I wasn't sure there was only one, but anyway. <laughs> I got to share one. Well, the point I'm trying to make here is that Ryan and Guilfoyle are still alive and they are the trailblazers. And it's shocking that here we are in, I'm not wishing them not to be alive, but you know, here we are in 2013 and the people who blazed a trail for women are still alive. It should have been years before. 
Neither of them would have had an easy time of it. Um, uh, I'm pretty sure of that. Uh, the difficulty may not have, however, been an overt discrimination. It's just a fact of life that when you're the new one in, in any field, in this case it happens to be gender, uh, you're different. You're in a different world and you don't feel included as the others are. Uh, the others know each other, perhaps they have overlapping networks, and you'll feel a little bit on the outer. To the extent that agenda issues are, uh, that, uh, I, don't, I don't mean gender issues, uh, gender issues are discussed offline, that can mean that you're not in those discussions. Because you didn't go to the bar for a drink before dinner or play tennis with the guys in the morning or whatever. Now you may say, so what, because it all gets dealt with at the meeting. But if informally, with no intention to lobby or exclude, over the course of days before a meeting, discussion takes place informally um, that leads to a particular point of view, then there's much less chance that the outsider, who hasn't been in the tennis and everything else, will get a chance to sway opinion. Let me put it to you this way. If Bob has already told Simon, Martin and Richard what his view is, he's not likely to go in the meeting and, and have a woman change his mind in front of Bob, Simon and Richard. He's just not going to do it. There are two exceptions to that. If he said, I think ABC, the exception will be when ABC is not very important and everyone's happy to give her something. She can have that, doesn't matter. But of course, if ABC isn't important, it probably wouldn't have been discussed in those discussions in the few days before. So uh, that doesn't uh, particularly work. The other example where you might get your way is where you present compelling evidence that ABC is a bad idea. That might need explanation, a compelling doesn't mean strong and persuasive argument, it really means to show this is a high risk strategy you're entering into and you, the bloke, could pay a high price for it. That's a compelling argument. Um, from my own time in Parliament being often the only one or one of two women at a meeting, I can assure you is a particular experience. Uh, all I ask is men to imagine what it's like to go to a meeting full of women. They don't enjoy it. You, I've been at them when there's been the only guy, and they don't enjoy it. They do feel uncomfortable. They're not sure what we're all going to say, and they're a little bit apprehensive. Uh, it might have changed, but I doubt it's changed a, a huge amount. Now, at that time, there were many, many men who wanted to be seen to do the right thing, and therefore your opinion was often sought when it wouldn't have been different. There are lots of issues that aren't don't have a different gender perspective, but oh, we better ask the women what they think. So you come and ask, ask your view on something when you might say, well, look, I don't really care. It's not that important to me, but yeah, you, you've been asked, so you better, uh, you know, chip in because otherwise us other women don't care. So um, what I'm trying to convey to you here is being the odd one out or, or two out isn't particularly difficult. It's just the constancy of that uh, gets a bit wearing. It's not hard. It's no big deal. It's no great burden. It's just wearing. Now, we all understand that small talk goes on. Let me just check when I need to finish to make sure that I don't completely. Good. <laughs> uh, but that small talk can leave uh, women out in the cold. It doesn't mean, I don't mean by that that if women get together, they're going to talk about recipes and things. I can assure you they don't. I used to sometimes have women's drinks. You know, Liberal, Labor, Democrats, the whole lot. At the end of the session, and I can assure you we weren't swapping recipes. We might be storing, sharing stories about, you know, um, who's a bit, which guy's a bit slow off the mark, <laughs> which guys take themselves too seriously on all sides. And one in particular I remember whose comments were so fake that we were all, compliments were so fake we were all revolted. Uh, <laughs> and we'd have a drink and a laugh about the guys in that context and no one ever let anyone else down and blabbed that what you thought. So what I'm trying to say is when guys go on about their guy things, they're just being guys. They're not trying to be exclusionary. Some men would make lighthearted jokes. It's a bit pathetic, isn't it? You get a grown man who's a member of parliament, comes up when there's a few women dining together, two or three, and says, oh, the sisterhood dining tonight. Oh, well, let me strap my sides up. I'm going to break my sides laughing. <laughs> you know? There's a, there's a big joke. Somehow, it's just they want to feel savvy or feel they were snags or something. I don't, I don't know. Show they were snags. It reminds me of a story. I'll come back to the story about snags. Now, look, it is important to focus on the history of the uh, women entering Parliament and the achievements made for women. That is important. But I'll tell you something I think is more important, and that's to stop asking women 
who are in parliament to talk about being a woman in parliament. Just bloody stop. <laughs> Ask them to talk about the economy or space or something that shows that they're there because they're competent and can do all the issues that men can do. The last thing you should ask a woman in parliament to talk about, it's all right for us that are out of it, but the, the ones that are in, the last thing you should ask them to talk about, in my view, is women's issues. Give them a break and show that they can succeed by doing their job well, not by being seen first as female and second as competent. Do it the other way around. Reg Withers once uh, said to me when I asked him a question, he said, look, you're paid the same as me and elected by the same amount, figure it out for yourself. And I thought, rude old bastard. <laughs> but actually, I think he was making a very good point. You are equally here and you are equally entitled to have your say and I'm not gonna be suckered in to uh, you know, kidding, kidding you or letting you think otherwise. Let me finish by pointing out what I think is one of the main problems for women in politics, well it was then anyway, and that is a particular weakness of men. Isn't it funny? The problem for women is the weakness of men and the weakness is their ego. It's so important to them. Unlike women, they haven't been toughened up by centuries of being treated as the underdog. They haven't had, had the biffing that we've had, poor little darlings, and so they're fragile. <laughs> so, a guy that worked for me was leaving to go and work in London. I still have contact with this bloke. He said, look, I can give you something. I can explain something to you. You go to meetings, you've got all the facts and figures. You think if you make a cogent argument, you should win. And you come back so shattered when it doesn't happen. I said, yes, you understand. He said, well, I do understand. He said, look, I was in the public service. And if, if, if I went to a meeting and a bloke, put, in a sense, showed me up in front of other blokes, I wouldn't forget it. If a woman did it, I'd be really humiliated. So why you think that's going to work, I don't know. So I can share with you my tip for dealing with these old-fashioned guys. When they say something's ridiculous, don't verbalise that to them because they go straight into defence mode. If you say to a woman it's ridiculous, she says, why? You say that to a bloke, he thinks, oh, I have to fix you up. So they go into defence mode. Just say, that's a really interesting idea, as you tell yourself, crazy is interesting. <laughs> Then say, you know, lots of people would agree with that, because you know lots of crazies <laughs> to yourself. At this point, he feels relaxed and not under any attack at all. Then you say something like, just before you make up in this mind, your mind on this, that's Mem Saeb, you are the, the decision maker. There's just a few risks to watch out for to ensure you don't end up getting burnt. He's thinking you want to help him. He's ready to listen. Now, much is said about women achieving their full potential. We see a, a lot of that in the Fin Review today about some women that have done terrific things. I'm tempted to say, well, look, politics is harder. I don't think it is. Every, every industry has its difficulties. Uh, the only reason you might think politics is harder is because it's so combative, so competitive, so brutal and so public. And I'm not sure all those other things are, but I'm sure they've got their problems. I think. The real benchmark for achievement is not whether effective women get their due, because in the end that's probably going to happen. It doesn't always happen, but neither do effective men always get their due. The real test of equality is whether if you think of the least effective man in a job, think of an idiot who's got a job. <laughs> Why did that whacker get that job? And when an equally whacker woman can get that job, then you've got equality. <laughs> Let me finish by saying th th there are gender perspectives. Rosemary's dealt with some of them. Uh, the one I dealt with was the sex slave trade. Uh, we had English adopted laws, which were clearly out of date. Why would anyone think we'd need new slavery laws? But as it turns out, we ended up needing them. And I'm not sure that if a bloke had had the justice portfolio at the time, it would have been done, it didn't seem quickly, but as quickly um, as it was done. Uh, we did get the legislation in. We finally got it passed with an election in between time. No doubt it's been amended into some other form now. Uh, but bear this in mind. If you want to understand how sexist and shallow our society can be, consider the media's first response to intelligence we released highlighting that problem. The phone calls came thick and fast. Have you got one? Have you got one? Have you got one we can interview? She was just going to be a piece of meat for the media machine. Thanks very much. There's, um
there's almost no comment I can make in relation to that speech <laughs> without getting myself into trouble. So instead, I'll uh, introduce our third uh, panellist, Laura Tingle, who's the political editor of the Australian Financial Review. She's covered politics, policy and economics from Canberra since 1986 for The Australian, The Age, The Sydney Morning Herald and this, now The Australian Financial Review. Laura won the Paul Lynham Award for Press Gallery Journalism in 2004 and was shortlisted for the John Button Prize for Political Writing in 2010 and has won Walkley Awards in 2005 and 2011. She also has the single best avatar on Twitter. Um, I welcome uh, Laura Tingle. Thank you. Um, my brief is to talk about uh, the portrayal of women in Parliament in the media, so uh, that's, that's where I'm going today. When Bill Shorten uh, was elected as leader of the Federal Parliamentary Labor Party, uh, uh, and it was announced on Sunday afternoon, the Sydney Morning Herald columnist Mike Carlson, with tongue in cheek, tweeted, Mr Shorten looked radiant in a tailored charcoal suit, crisp white shirt and crushed mulberry tie. A younger female tweeter responded, also with just a touch of irony, I thought his hips looked big. <laughs> it's true, isn't it, that what male politicians are wearing, or whether it makes their bum look big, isn't always the first port of call in the way they are portrayed in the media. Though there are exceptions, such as Bob Catter with his very, very large, very Queensland hat. It's hard not to start a review of the way the media has portrayed female parliamentarians on the very sore point of the obsessions with what they look like, if for no other reason than we have just gone through a tumultuous period in federal politics where what the Prime Minister was wearing, what she looked like, and what she looked like became an essential part of the daily political discussion. Images are so powerful, and the media, both because it works in shorthand and because it reflects back on us the views in our community, is prone to stereotyping. A UNESCO report in 2009 described the common images of women in the media, the glamorous sex kitten, the sainted mother, the devious witch, the hard-faced corporate and political climber. Perhaps one of the reasons the media has had such trouble over the years, not just here but around the world, in finding a way to portray women in politics is because so many of those stereotypes don't quite work. And of course, that may be partly because none of those stereotypes go to basic questions of competence and properly won authority. I'm going to talk a lot about stereotypes today and how the ones applied to women in federal parliament by the media have evolved over the years. But if I was only to venture down that path in this talk, I would be doing a considerable disservice to the history of women in the federal parliament. I sometimes think that the frustration with dealing with the stereotypes overlooks both what actually happens in the parliament and the considerable advances that have been made by women in becoming accepted in parliament, their enormous contribution to policy and politics, and also the positive changes that, that have taken place in the way the media portrays women MPs, certainly during the almost 30 years I've worked in the Canberra Press Gallery. The thing that struck me when I started preparing this talk were, a bit like Amanda and Rosemary, how utterly shocking the numbers were and had been when I arrived in Canberra. In 1987, it was not unusual for there to be female ministers. Uh, it, was still it was still astonishing um, Oh, I've completely confused myself there, but yeah. anyway, there had been 25 female senators since Federation when I arrived in Canberra, but more extraordinary from the perspective of 2013, just 11 female members of the House of Representatives elected in 86 years. When I arrived in Canberra, there'd been one Liberal Cabinet Minister, Margaret Guilfoyle, one Labor Cabinet Minister, Susan Ryan. I remember when Ryan was appointed ed Education Minister by Bob Hawke in 1983. The cartoonist Patrick Cook drew Hawke saying something to the effect of, I've already made my biggest decision, finding a job important enough for Susan Ryan. It was light-hearted, but the cartoon reflected the mood of the times. Women in parliament were a trend that male politicians knew they should, should ascribe to. We were still talking serious novelty value in the media. It was post-women's lib, but a time when the media went out looking for stories about successful women in business and politics, but found them quite thin on the ground. The issue of the role of women was, by 1983, part of the fabric of the new government. Yet I remember very well from this time my good friend Gillian Broadbent, who went on to be a member of the Reserve Bank Board. Um, when, in, 19, in the early 1980s, she was the director of one of Australia's most successful merchant banks. 
Invariably, when journalists wanted to write a piece about women in business, they went to her because they had found earlier profiles in the clippings. Broadbent got to the point where she declined in her wonderfully gracious way to be part of any more of these pieces. If people just keep seeing me and a couple of other women in all these pieces, she said, they'll come to the view that we're the only ones who've actually made it. So the more sophisticated end of the media was a bit stuck. How on the one hand, on the one hand you wanted to profile prominent women where you found them. On the other, there was always the risk that by writing, gee, and she's a woman pieces, you were continuing the idea that it was unusual for women to be in such roles, which at the time it was. And whether it was male politicians coming to terms with female arrivals or the media, media in Canberra, it was a little unclear how to proceed. In Canberra, the number of female senators was starting to grow, but the number of MPs in the House of Representatives was still relatively small. One of the first MPs to get a lot of media attention was Ros Kelly, the member for Canberra. But a 1995 profile of Kelly notes that from the press has come have come allegations of her using her children, her dog, her football team, a cooking book she wrote for constituents, her hair, and more to further her political career. Her travails in dealing with the attitudes of her fellow MPs were also recorded. Mick Young was said to have commented when he was stood down as Special Minister of State during the Paddington Bear Affair in 1984 that within half an hour, Ros was in my office taking measurements for curtains. In 1987, Woman's Day ran a profile of Kelly when she was appointed a junior minister. The heading, Ros Kelly, I'd quit politics for my family. Why do I single out Ros Kelly? Partly because she was becoming a minister at the time I arrived in Canberra, but importantly because she was the first Labor woman from the House of Representatives to become a minister. As I mentioned earlier, there'd always been more women in the Senate than the House, and there is a very different atmospheric in the Red Chamber, which I think, I was, which I think was reflected in the way women in the Parliament were portrayed in the media. The more civilised nature of the Senate, its less gladiatorial atmospherics, its focus on the details of policy, tended to filter down to the way women senators have been portrayed over the years. If you think of the names that come to mind in terms of prominent federal female politicians in the last 30 years, so many of them are senators. Guilfoyle, Ryan, Haynes, Kerno, Crowley, Vanstone, Bishop, Hanson, Young, Wong. It's not a question of softer treatment in the media, just the likelihood that earlier on, the substance of what they were saying was likely to be able to cut through rather than the stereotypes about the fact they were women. It's been different in the House. I've always thought that there is no tougher test for a politician than standing at the dispatch box in the House of Representatives. My personal view is that few women over the years have actually been able to muster that sense of authority and control over the chamber that you really need to really pass that test. Of course, not all blokes manage it either, but it has been even harder for women and it has influenced the way they have been reported on in the media. Ros Kelly, for example, never quite conquered the House from the, from the dispatch box. The women who have managed it by Managed, women who have managed it, uh, who immediately come to mind, are Carmen Lawrence, Bronwyn Bishop, Julie Bishop, Julia Gillard as Deputy Prime Minister, and Tanya Plibersek. I've also talked about Kelly because I think the 1980s really started to see the long road proper travelled upwards by women in federal politics in Australia. We had moved on from militant feminism to a time when women were seeking to get into politics simply because they wanted to do it and had the qualifications for the job. There's a fascinating Canadian study from the 1990s that reviewed the changing media portrayals of women. There are lots of similar studies conducted in Europe and the US more recently with very similar findings. And it is a depressingly similar story to the Australian one, showing a certain lack of creativity in media stereotypes. And I think it gives us some insights into the universal roots of the recent debate in Australia about the treatment of our first female prime minister. The Canadian study argues that in the first two thirds of the century, Two strategies were used to normalise women in politics, for which the authors meant a woman's femaleness was neutered. The stereotypes were built around a female MP's family relationships. Various examples given were women elected to parliament who were represented as a wife or widow, as, and thus as appendages of powerful husbands. Then there were cases like Golda Meir and Indira Gandhi, two powerful prime ministers who were degendered in a different way as grandmother Golda, or Nehru's daughter. Their political status was lowered because their actions were viewed through a family lens. The study argues that one of the things that changed the stereotypes was neither the changes in the way the female politicians operated, nor the way the media operated, but the fact in many democracies, a gender 
a gender gap started to be observed between the voting intentions of men and women, which forced both the political establishment and the media to rethink the way politics worked. The result was a whole new set of stereotypes, which emerged in the 1980s and 90s, the most spectacular and visible being that of the superwoman, who succeeded at all levels. She combined a family with her career and was seen as being groomed as she is incompetent in her ministerial responsibility. A second stereotype was that of the champion, which tended to be applied to women politicians of a certain age who had led a more traditional life. The study noted that the important difference in the two eras of stereotypes was that at least the stereotypes had moved from women politicians being defined by what happened at home to being defined by their relationships in the public domain. Built upon these stereotypes were narratives that applied only to women and which, amongst other things, tended to ignore the substance of a female MP's speeches in favour of her personal characteristics like dress, made women politicians responsible for women as a class, and used feminism to denote a negative personal characteristic. The study argued that women MPs were evaluated differently to, uh, to men. Women had to live up to a considerably higher standard of excellence than do men. The political performance of women were judged only by the extremes of the scale, good and bad, while men were evaluated across the whole scale, including the mediocre middle. And women politicians had to live up to a moral code of sexual abstention not imposed on men. I have to say that all these things sound exceptionally familiar to me. Ros Kelly observed at the end of her career, the media either absolutely loves you or absolutely hates you. There's no, there's no in between. Carmen Lawrence called it the Madonna or the whore approach, and I think that's absolutely right. Cheryl Kernow was often written of as, of as a superwoman in the years when she was at her political peak as leader of the Australian Democrats, Democrats because she had a young daughter. But the number of female politicians in Canberra in the 90s 80s and 1990s who were younger and had small children were still reasonably limited. The prominent women who received a lot of focus as personalities rather than as ministers in the 80s and 90s tended to be a little older. Think Bronwyn Bishop and Carmen Lawrence. Bishop cut through in her early days by breaking the more polite habits of the stereotype and monstering public servants in estimates committees. <laughs> it was this aggression which helped cast her for some as a potential future prime minister. She brought this aggression to the House and has always applied, along with her experience as an amateur thespian, at the dispatch box. Lawrence was a competent minister, but she brought a politically lethal history of ugly controversy with her from her time as Premier in Western Australia. When the relentless pursuit of her over these events by the Liberal Party led to a state royal commission, we saw one of the stranger episodes unfold involving the role of women in politics. Lawrence would attend the royal commission each day, surrounded by female supporters, Bunches of flowers thrust at her like some feminist martyr. Female journalists in Canberra suddenly seemed under pressure to take Lawrence's side because they were women, rather than report the unfolding controversy for what it was, another, another nasty political contretemps in which Lawrence's hands were not entirely clean. In 1996 and 1998, the surge of younger women coming into the parliament really started to take off. Female MPs with little kids became less of a novelty, just something um, uh, that posed even more challenges for hard-working politicians. Women MPs tended not to plaster their kids all over their politics and media profiles. The number of female cabinet ministers increased and became less of a subject of con controversy. Ministers like Rosemary Crowley and Amanda Vanstone were written about for delivering or not delivering on their jobs, not because they were women. But the real challenge came as women started to move into leadership positions. Julie Bishop ascended to be deputy leader of the Liberal Party, this put her at the centre of the tactics meetings and shadow, minute, shadow cabinet deliberations. But she sometimes found herself not written into accounts of the machinations of these bodies. And her ability to survive a cavalcade of opposition leaders passing through the top office between 2007 and 2009 tended to be written in negative rather than positive terms. Julia Gillard was well liked as a deputy leader and deputy prime minister and reported on positively in the media for her, co her competence and hard work. She was a strong performer in Parliament. At the same time, it is hard to forget that an image that had a powerful effect on people's views of Gillard was the one of her sitting in the empty kitchen with the empty fruit bowl. The events of 2010 and her rise to the Prime Ministership saw all the stereotypes come screaming back, though Lady Macbeth seemed to be the dominant one. It is worth noting that it was not in Australia where the media had trouble making it was, sorry, it was not it was worth noting that it was not just in Australia where the media had trouble making the leap from the general proposition of women in politics to the idea of a female political leader. In the US, the 2008 election campaign saw both Hillary Clinton and Sarah Palin 
drawn using different, very unflattering stereotypes. This brings us to the changes in the media that have in, uh, have in turn affected the way our federal politicians are portrayed. Once again, we are not just talking about an Australian phenomena. Media scholars referred to the tabloidisation of the media, that is, a journalism that thrives on sensation and scandal, person personalises, simplifies, ignores the public issue and favourite private ones, and favours striking visuals over serious analysis. That process in Australia has been fuelled by the decline of the broadsheet papers and print media generally, <clears throat> and in federal politics by the crossing of the Rubicon by Laurie Oakes in 2002, when he criticised Cheryl Curnow for failing to mention in her autobiography her extramarital affair while leader of the Democrats with Gareth Evans, then deputy Labor leader and a key figure in her move to the Labor Party. Some people claim that this passed the legitimate public interest test, since it cast a new light on Curnow's decision to change parties. I've never been completely sure about that. What, is certainly, what it certainly did was make our politicians' private lives fair game. This had not generally been the case before this, and going back to the Canadian uh, uh, analysis, I believe it has revealed a different media standard for the way the media expect women to conduct their personal lives to the way it treats men. Extensive revelations of male MPs' travel rorts in the late 1990s, for example, really explicitly mentioned that the wrongfully claimed expenses, sometimes but not always, involved the fact that the MPs were not sleeping in the beds they were supposed to be sleeping in. More recently, there have been cases of coy story, stories appearing suggesting federal ministers are having affairs with their staff, with no names given, but rather threats that they will be exposed if they do not desist. All this brings us to Julia Gillard. <clears throat> Nobody quite put the role of Jill Gillard's gender in the nature of her prime ministership better than she did on the day she lost the leadership of the Labor Party. It doesn't explain everything, it doesn't explain nothing, it explains some things. Julia Gillard worked unbelievably hard and achieved a lot. She gave it her all. But my own assessment of her was that she was always a deeply flawed Prime Minister, even before she had to confront a wall of media and public hostility and craziness. Certainly the circumstances of her rise created a new hostility to the Prime Minister and awoke, and awoke what turns out to be an element of appalling misogyny in Australian society, to which I can attest from the emails and letters I've received about the Prime Minister over the past few years, which have been truly shocking in their nastiness, and I'm not easily shocked. But beyond the really crazy level, I think the Prime Minister affronted almost all of those two easy stereotypes I spoke of earlier. She wasn't married, she didn't have kids, she could not neither be cast as some bloke's female relative or as a superwoman. When the media did discuss her relationships with men, it was either to use them to ascribe sexually transmitted criminality to her or to implicitly question her own sexuality. And of course, most, not most, most noticeably, there were no limits put on either the comments or the aspersions cast on the prime, former Prime Minister, even if she held the most powerful job in the country. So it was okay to suggest she be drowned in a sack, stand in front of signs saying, ditch the witch, or ask her, with her, ask her whether her partner was gay. It didn't even stop after she left public life. I'm ashamed to say the Financial Review ran a gossip item just last month on the back of a piece in Women's Day, for God's sake, which asked whether Gillard and her partner, Tim Matheson, had split up. The former Prime Minister was furious about the piece. I found it objectionable for other reasons. On, on the Friday, our rear window gossip column sanctimoniously thundered, why the hell haven't any other media organisations chased this huge story? Surely the immediate breakdown after losing office of the former Prime Minister's seven year de facto relationship is news of national significance. This is a bloke who lived in the lodge, stayed at Kirribilli House, and did the first bloke thing with enthusiasm. Four days later, after Gillard had angrily denied the story and demanded unsuccessfully that it be removed from our website, Rear Window wrote this piece as it noted Gillard's appearance at the Opera House with Anne Summers. We wondered a few weeks ago whether Gillard might use this venue to unleash. We just hadn't thought it would be on us. It was a piece in Bauer Media rag, Woman's Day, that did the damage. How utterly gutless and pathetic. All that brave journalism demanding someone chase this huge story of national significance had simply become an innocent report of what a women's magazine had said. What is certainly true is that if you had inserted John and Jeanette Howard into the copy, it would not have got into the paper. I will conclude on that career enhancing note by simply, <laughs> <laughs> but simply observe that one of the changes that is taking place with social media and the internet is that our politicians, both male and female, have more ability to portray themselves as they wish to to the public. So it's worth looking at the websites of our MPs and senators 
and see how they are choosing to do so and whether even there they are able to escape the stereotypes. Thank you, Laura. Um, we do have some time for uh, some questions. Uh, you'll notice that there are some microphones, uh, two down here and one upstairs, if people do um, have questions they'd like to ask. Um, please come to the microphone so you can ask questions of particular panellists or to all of our panellists. I would ask that you uh, keep the questions uh, brief so that the answers can take up the bulk of the time that we have available. Please. I don't have a question. It, it, it'll come on up there. I don't have a question. I would just like to make a public acknowledgement and a thank you to Rosemary Crawley. You don't remember me, Rosemary. We, when you were the Minister for the Status of Women in 1994, you and I met and I discussed with you the possibility of having a national day that focused on breast cancer awareness and research. And uh, you were very enthusiastic about it. I had been lobbying for three years unsuccessfully, all the politicians, and, and they were supported, but no one would take any action. You told me to write the proposal and the subject for the, the proposal and the budget. It was accepted. In September of 1994, Mrs. Keating launched Australia Breast Cancer Day. She announced the establishment of the Kathleen Cunningham Foundation, now known as the National Breast Cancer Center for Breast Cancer Awareness, and the National Breast Cancer, um, the other one, for research. And so you have saved, because of your action, you have been responsible for saving many women in Australia from developing breast cancer and making them more aware of the disease. So thank you very, very much. Rosemary. Thank you so much. Um, is that just right to speak here? Yeah, um, I didn't expect to applaud it, but one of the things I left out of my speech, I actually took it down from 40 pages to 15. It was still too long. Um, sorry about that. But I did want to talk about the changed language. And one of the best examples I know is that um, men had no health problems except heart attacks up until very recently. Yeah. There was no language for men's health. I remember a Liberal man saying to me when I was not long in Parliament, it's not fair that you've got a women's health policy. Why haven't we got a men's health policy? And I said something like, um, well, you've been in charge for 100 years. <laughs> but I realise now that there was no language for men to talk about men's health. They only had heart attacks. And, and that was the only real health policy for on behalf of men. So I want to acknowledge, um, and it gives me some trouble to say things, good things about Jeff Kennett, but he did a couple of really wonderful things, and one was to start Beyond Blue. And that is amazing. It's outed a depression for men and men's health. It's an extraordinary achievement. And I think the other thing is that men's prostates are now on the uh, public debate and even on telly. <laughs> And while uh, maybe we don't want to think too much about it, I do. I think it's absolutely critical that blokes now learn to talk about health, that they're encouraged politically to do what women very comfortably did, but thank you for that support. So uh, prostates and probably a few other things besides will new, soon hit the agenda. We have a question in the back of the room. Marion Saw from the Australian National University. Uh, thank you all uh, for most enjoyable presentations. I have questions for Amanda Vanstone and for Rose Crowley. Amanda, I've just been rereading um, Tony Abbott's battle lines and I note his comments on the Howard ca Cabinet that uh, they could always rely on Amanda Vanstone to um, put a woman's perspective when needed. <laughs> Otherwise, she brought a practical common sense to the consideration of political problems. So I'd like to ask you for a couple more examples of the women's perspective that you brought to Cabinet, apart from the very good example of sex slavery, which you did uh, talk about. And uh, to, to Rose, you um, emphasise the importance of measurement of the impact of policy on women and of decent uh, data for this purpose. So I wonder why you think that the Australian Parliament, unlike other Western parliaments and other Western democracies, has never had a standing committee on gender equality to oversight 
gender analysis of policy in government and the collection of adequate data. Because it seems to me if we had such a standing committee, it probably would have preempted what happened this year, which was the uh, dropping of the time use survey, the only ABS survey which measures women's unpaid work and its intersection. With paid work, its contribution to the economy. We lost that this year. We didn't have a standing parliamentary committee with a mandate to keep an eye on things such as that. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Look, I, I don't know that I can help uh, because I, I wasn't the sort, some people obviously do keep diaries, but um, uh, I never did. Uh, partly because when I started in Parliament there weren't computers and I was terrified if I kept a diary people would nick it and then if you'd told the truth in it, uh, which was why would you keep a diary if you didn't? Uh, you know, your colleagues might find out what you thought of them. And <laughs> might not be such a good idea for all relationships, as we all know, it's best sometimes to keep things to yourselves, to yourself. Um, but I think there'd be plenty of occasions that on a day-to-day -day basis where gender perspective might make a difference and, and be different, but I didn't try and keep a list of them. I mean, the welfare area, it would be an obvious one. There might be one in health. Uh, um, uh, perhaps there would be in sport. There'd be a whole range of them, but none, none particularly um, stand out. I haven't read um, battle lines. I don't uh, read political, uh, you know, commentary sort of uh, books because um, I just think I'm too busy saying what I want to say. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not sure, to be honest, let me say that, I'm not, I'm not or frank, because um, I'm always honest, um, I'm not terribly sure uh, about them. In fact, I was harassed by a publisher today who's been at me about writing a book, and um, I'm just not comfortable about it because I know that if I sign on the dotted line, because they send you these letters with, you know, money, sign here, uh, that I'll produce something and then they'll try and goad me into telling stories I don't want to tell. And if you've, if you've made a part of your political life anyway has been being the good team player, I don't see why you'd chuck that away for a lousy book where you pontificate on other people. No, I don't think I'll do that. I, I might do it, but I'll, I'll have to avoid that, and that, that, that means they might not be interested in the book. <laughs> You're right? Yeah. Um, well, one thing I know about Amanda is it would make a good read, whatever she wrote. <laughs> See, that's what they um, say, but I'm not so sure. <laughs> Um, as to the the data about uh, disaggregated data, um, where are you, Marion? Over there. Um, I, I think it is terribly important, and I was really very disappointed that one of the first things Mr. Howard did was to do away with the women's budget paper, and uh, that that was um, a, an amazing, interesting thing. I finished up at the United Nations uh, shortly after that, and I was approached by South Africa and Japan. Because you have had a women's budget paper, we are planning to introduce those, uh, oh, each of them, one into South Africa and one into Japan. Would I care to support it? Well, I was delighted to support it. I understand, I think South Africa has, Japan has not, or the other way around. One, one succeeded, one didn't. And it might be very interesting to do what you're proposing, which is to have something besides party political people who might set up the requirement for the data. But the data from the women's budget paper was extraordinary. It, it, it really quite shocked people. The example about women's sport is um, to the point and very easy to understand. But if you looked at Social Security, which spends a lot of money, oh, I would suggest um, more than 50% certainly would go to women. Uh, whether you took at age pensions and so on, uh, they would be much more 50-50. But the data was really very interesting. Uh, people were shocked when they actually had a look at the disaggregated data. And I think it actually allows for then more considered future policies in certain areas. So I'd strongly support some way of getting back to collecting or having that kind of data and um, any other uh, dis disaggregated data about men and women. It's, it makes... Um, <laughs> it saves a lot of stupid arguments, and that's one I think it's very best reason. So um, I think, thank you for the question. I wish we had what, had it still, one way or another. Just got time for one more question, and we have one more questioner. Good afternoon. My name is Twin Yuin. I work for the Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet. My question is to any member of the panel. 
um, I want to know how can we encourage and empower more ethnic representation in parliament and particularly ethnic women? Thanks. Do you want to start? Um, um, in a way, what I'd say was powerful about the women's movement was that it was started by women outside of parliament. And so I would have thought the best thing would be for ethnic women, um, and I don't know whether you, you would say all ethnic women or whether it would be this, this group and this group and this group, but I think the powerful thing about the women's movement in the 60s and the 70s was that it was women who started it and women from across the board. In fact, um, I don't know how many of you were alive in the 70s, very few. Um, you're all too young. <laughs> Thank you very much. But um, uh, I'd lived in America in the 60s, where I learned to write with the best of them, and I think one of the things they had was the burgeoning women's movement, and it began to be um, in, in all places, everywhere. Would we actually go and protest at supermarkets at the price of, of goods? Would we protest at universities about something? Would we protest about in schools about education and so on? Um, but it was um, uh, from the women themselves, and I would suggest that that would be one awfully good way to start. But you might also find a, a political group that was sympathetic, and you might want to see if you couldn't get some support and help in that direction too. But what I do say is, um, as I think I made the comment, uh, we need more representation until we're actually in our parliaments talking about all the people in Australia for and on behalf of all the people in Australia and importantly, listening to them all, uh, then I think we're still short of what democracy really means. Um, I'd like to add to that. Uh, look, I think it's a difficult, um, a difficult road and the reason I think it's difficult is this. Unless you're a full-blood Indigenous Australian, you've got migrant blood in your veins. That's what we are. We're a, one of the big three migration nations, us, Canada and the United States. And uh, so really, if you rephrase what you've said, it, it comes down to a question of, well, a, a representation of newer migrants here rather than older ones. And then that leaves you represent, being seen to represent a smaller proportion of people. And uh, the reason I think it's hard is, hell, we're having trouble getting 50% women in. So if you want to get more in from a, a smaller um, cohort, it's going to be harder, uh, unless uh, you run, in the end, on the basis of capacity. Uh, I think that's the way uh, always uh, to get in. I'm reminded of Cathy Sullivan, who was a former senator, went down to the House of Reps. She got so damn sick of men saying, oh, well, I don't think we should have you know, more women in here just because they're women, you know, I think people should be selected on merit. And her fantastic response to that was, really, how did you get here? <laughs> okay. I think Laura has something to add. Yeah, yeah, I was just going to add at the end, um, I mean, it, I was at a diplomatic function last week where uh, a group of businessmen from another country were not talking about uh, the lack of ethnic women in the parliament, but just talking about the lack of ethnic diversity in the parliament. Um, and I think there is that broader point. Um, Rosemary and Amanda know much more about the machinations of parties and how they choose people, but I, it seems to me that we're still stuck in a bit of a period of uh, tokenism about these things, you know, where people say, oh, look, we've got a Vietnamese person. Oh, actually, no, they're not Vietnamese, they're Chinese, you know, same sort of thing, uh, or whatever. I mean, the, it was the, the other way around during the election campaign, I think. Uh, but, um, yeah, so it's, I, it, it, I think it, the reality is that it goes to the way the parties choose people and that in the same way they don't see women as tokens, uh, as, as uh, representatives, um, they sort of say, well, we are a much more diverse society and we should represent all of those diversities in the parliament. Thanks very much. Uh, we've got one uh, more occasional lecture in the series uh, next month. You can find the details on the normal place on the website. And there's also a conference coming up next month, the uh, Andrew Inglis Clark conference. And again, the details are there on the website if you're interested. Um, if you could, though, join me today in thanking our three um, accomplished panellists for their uh, views, uh, Dr Rosemary Crowley, Amanda Vanstone, and Laura Tingle.